Hello and welcome to Sports Zone. We are starting with the important things as we usually do. Studio 90, I'm joined by Aaron as usual. And sort of a light week in terms of news for soccer because uh, a lot of the European leagues are on international break, but it is sort of an important time of the year. It's the last international friendlies before the World Cup in Russia this summer. Uh, there were some marquee friendlies that were played, uh, Germany playing Spain, um, Portugal playing Egypt, uh, France also a favorite was in action against Colombia. So Aaron, on the balance of some of these favorites that we saw in action over the past week, what are some of the major takeaways about some of those favorites going into uh, Russia? One of the major take takeaways I took was France, and they're a team that everybody always mentions is one of the best teams in the world because they have so many talented players. But they've never really been able to put it together and win an international trophy in the, in the past you know, decade or so. And I think that definitely showed in their, in their friendly versus Colombia when they lost. You know, they didn't play up to their potential. Uh, obviously, they have a great team, especially like their midfield and attack are fantastic, but maybe just not able to put it together just yet. Um, so definitely that was a major takeaway, France losing. And I think another major takeaway was Portugal and their game versus Egypt, you know. Uh, a lot of people look at Portugal as a one-man team with Cristiano Ronaldo, and that kind of showed because they were down 1-0 throughout the entire game, and Ronaldo scores two goals in injury time. So that, that was definitely uh, something that I found interesting. And another major takeaway was uh, England being the Netherlands. Uh, you know, a lot of people look at England as a team that, you know, they can never really put it together on the international level. So being able to get a win versus the Netherlands team, who even though they're not in the World Cup are pretty good, being able to get a win is good because they can get a little momentum going and maybe, uh, you know, surprise some people this summer in Russia. And you mentioned England. That's sort of an interesting uh, thing to look at their team because their captain, their sort of star player, Harry Kane, injured his ankle in the series of league fixtures before the international break. They don't really know the severity of Harry Kane's ankle injury. He may miss out on Russia. He may not. If he gets back in time, he might be a little rusty. Do you see that England sort of the expectation should be different with a team that has Harry Kane versus one that doesn't have him leading the line? Absolutely. I think Harry Kane make or, makes or breaks this team. If you have Harry Kane, you're looking at a possible team that can make it out of the group stage and even make it to the maybe quarterfinals or, you know, in a dream scenario, semifinal. But without Harry Kane, you're looking at a team that, you know, is not able to score that many goals. And Harry Kane is sort of a guy that even if your team isn't playing well, he's able to pop out of nowhere and score. And with an inconsistent team like England, I think you need that guy, that number nine, who's always going to be able to score. And Harry Kane, who's been one of the best strikers in the world for the past few years, certainly is that guy for them. So if they don't have them, that's going to be a major loss. And even if they do, he might be a little rusty. So this injury definitely coming at a terrible time for England. But if Harry Kane is able to make a good recovery and is able to come back strong, then England may be a team that can surprise some people in the summer. And certainly, at least England fans could maybe look optimistically. They've got a bit of an easier group, so if Harry Kane comes back and is a little rusty, they maybe can ease him into action and get him ready for those knockout stage games, obviously, of higher importance. Uh, but shifting from teams that are playing friendlies, looking forward to the summer, to a team that's playing that has no bearings for the summer because they failed to qualify. That is, uh, the U.S. men's national team has a, a friendly against Paraguay this week. And there's a lot of new faces that are being called up for a squad that still doesn't have a full-time manager, a lot of uncertainty about uh, what's going forward. But um, Aaron, are you, do you sort of agree with this approach of starting over, so to speak, and bringing in all these young, fresh faces who aren't capped with the national team to sort of correct some of the failures of the past World Cup cycle? You know, I think it's the only really approach you can take at this point, you know, not being in the World Cup this summer. you got to bring in some new faces. you got to bring in some young players because that's been something the U.S. team has been afraid to do over the past few years, and you saw it during qualifying. They sort of, you know, reverted back to these old players who maybe aren't at the top of their game but have international experience, and obviously that didn't work. So the U.S. national team, as, as an organization, they need to trust their young players more. They need to trust their young players to be able to put them in good situations. Situations. And I think this this current roster, which is the youngest that they've uh, ever called up, is a step in the right direction in that you know they're calling up young players. Now, a lot of these guys are unproven, and we don't really know how good they are, but you've got a couple of faces in there. One guy I'd like to talk about is Tyler Adams, the midfielder from New York Red Bulls, who at 19 years of age is an excellent all-around player. So he's a guy that I can definitely see you know starting for the U.S. in the years to come. So a guy like him and other young guys, you know, it's tough not being in the World Cup this summer, but the future is looking pretty bright with some of these guys they called up. Certainly, and these are guys playing at 
uh, top levels across Europe, not just looking at MLS, but the sort of broadening the scope of the U.S. men's national team sort of talent pool, which was a criticism of Bruce Arena certainly in his time as the manager, but uh, something to keep an eye on, as, especially over the next four years, because the U.S. is really building up for the 2022 qualification. Um, and I think finally, before we end, we'll end with the, some big news surrounding MLS, a big name coming to MLS, um, potentially changing sort of a narrative of MLS being a, a, a retirement league, so to speak. But that's Manchester United. Zlatan Ibrahimovic uh, announced he was coming to join the LA Galaxy. Uh, Aaron, do you see this move as sort of a, a type of players like Sebastian Giovinco, those type of players coming over, or more in the, uh, the vein of uh, Andrea Pirlo, who's just coming over to sort of go through the motions? Right. Well, there always has been the stereotype about the MLS that it is a retirement league. And a few years ago, I believe that, you know, that sort of had some truth to it. You know, we were bringing a lot of old players from Europe. But over the past few years, you've seen a sort of change where instead of bringing in old players from Europe, we're bringing in young players from South America. And that has definitely improved the, the quality of the league and changed it. But I think when you look at Zlatan, you're looking at a different animal because this is a guy who has succeeded in every single league he's been at the world. He's been in France, in Italy, in Spain, in England, and he's pretty much succeeded everywhere he's gone. I definitely think he still has a chip on his shoulder. And this is a guy who, you know, I think he's still got a lot left in the tank. So. I expect Zlatan Ibrahimovic to be good in MLS. I expect him to score a lot of goals. You know, he's so physically imposing, you know, more so than most players in MLS. I think, you know, his physique is going to carry him to a lot of goals. So I definitely see this more as a Sebastian Giovinco situation than a Pirlo situation where he comes here to just sort of play for the emotion. I don't think Zlatan Ibrahimovic is that sort of guy, that sort of player. And I definitely think that you're going to see a guy with a chip on his shoulder and you're going to see some very good games from Zlatan Ibrahimovic with the LA Galaxy. And do you think this will be good in terms of sort of the visibility and maybe credibility of the league because a guy like Zlatan, very outspoken, a lot of eyeballs, do you think that in, in the long term will be good for MLS? Well, I definitely think it will be. I think when you look at not just MLS, all you know, American sports league, there, it's always easy to able, able to market the, those big personality guys, those guys who, you know, they can grab the attention of the fans. And Zlatan Ibrahimovic certainly is that guy. So while I still do believe that MLS need to bring in those young players from South American Europe in instead of the old players, I think with Zlatan Ibrahimovic, you've got a different situation. And the fact that he's such a global name, that he could definitely bring some people to MLS, and maybe even after he's gone, you know, people might still be watching after he leaves. Certainly, LA daring to Zlatan, and we'll see how that works out for them. We'll keep an eye on sort of the league fixtures, which should pick up uh, when we resume our coverage next week. Uh, that's all the time we have for this edition of Studio 90, but stick around for more Sports Zone after this.